Hello, everyone. We are live again. Signet Theater, San Diego. Today I'm talking to my dear friend, Nathan Allen Davis. Um, he's a playwright. He wrote The Wind and the Breeze that we did a few years ago. Um, he also has had plays at the McCarter Theater and New York Theater Workshop. He's in development at The Public, at Arena Stage. Um, he's a, in residence at Princeton. Um, and he writes for television. There he is. Yo, Hi, what's Nathan. Up, man? How you doing? How you doing, Robbie? Good to see you. You too, man. Wow, look at your beard. It's it's yeah it's impressive. Uh appreciate that. Thank you. Where are yeah. you where are you? Are you in LA right now? I am actually in Vermont right now, of all places. Um, very fortunate that I have a friend of the family that has a vacation home here and they uh giving us a place to stay during this stuff so um were you in new york before yeah we were in new york you know for the first week or so of all the shutdown in our apartment and uh that was interesting yeah that's not the good good word to use where are you at you're i assume you're in san diego yeah cool man yeah so so how's your family? Hey, Elena. They're good. Oh, they're in. I tried to catch my youngest kid. She <laughs> ran away. Um, they're great. I hear her. Um, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can. So, so, um, for the people watching, um, uh Nathan uh I was telling a little bit about your background but I um we met a few years maybe 8 or 9 years ago at the Candy Center cuz you were there workshopping your play uh Win in the Breeze and we met for coffee afterwards. Yeah, remember that. Yeah. That was great. At that little coffee shop around the corner from the Kennedy Center. Yeah, and 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 in all your plays I think that I've read since then um, have really moved me. Uh, will you talk a little bit about, um, I guess, your process of writing and, 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 and your ability to weave in symbolism in, into all of your plays? Um, yeah, well, okay, I don't know, man. Uh, I think that, you know, every play is a different beast, and I'm definitely attracted to the poetic uh, possibilities of theater, and so finding a way to 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 make that happen is always something that I'm thinking about on some level. But it's weird, man. Like, you know, I think Wind in the Breeze is a play that um the version that you saw at the Kennedy Center. Like it wasn't really like done. Like, the, I mean, the, the ending was different, and like it took me like three or four years to kind of really find that play over various, you know what I mean, like workshop processes and stuff. And so, I would love to say that I have like a way of working that always works, but that really hasn't been quite the experience. It's more just getting in there and you know, having fun. And like the fact that you were so supportive of the play kind of meant everything because it actually was able to be brought to a full circle to become a production, you know what I mean? And like at a certain point, you just need people in the room with you who also believe in the thing to like make the thing happen, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a beautiful process. I think about our time at Theater Boston Court in Milwaukee Rep and then Signet, it was, a a beautiful journey. Definitely. You um. So, what are you working on now? I know you you have some productions coming up or were coming up. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, um, next week I have a workshop uh, with Arena Stage in DC. We're going to do it over Zoom. 
scripts for a new play called The High Ground. And uh, it's that was a, it was a commission that was meant to be, not meant to be, it was <laughs> commissioned to write a play that was dealing with Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so the sort of legacy of the massacre that happened there yeah. in 1921. And that's also a case where I had the initial conversation with the theater about what I would do around like making a play. And my basically what I said was, I've been learning about Black Wall Street and I think it's fascinating. And I, it's definitely a very, um, you know, like it's a, it's a part of history that certainly I think is important, but I have no idea how I might make a play out of it. Mm. And it's basically it took me a couple, maybe two or three years to come up with a, a first draft, or excuse me, first draft, a draft that felt like it was, you know, what it was supposed to be, or close to what it was supposed to be. I, I did a whole pass, and then kind of like threw it out and started over, or at least I should say, re fertil used it as fertilizer and started over. And um, so hopefully, uh, in this workshop, we're going to do, I'll have another step closer to something that's close to production ready ish. Mm -hmm. um, it's supposed to happen in February next year, but I guess we'll see mm -hmm. <laughs> how that ha you know, what, what happens. Yeah. Um, I like the way you worded that you you used it as fertilizer. I think about that a lot too. like you have as an artist giving yourself permission to make bad art sometimes or it accidentally becomes bad. But it's it that's valuable to create something better from it yeah i mean i wish it would just be like good <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i mean yeah i don't know man you know like i'm trying i'm also teaching right now and it's just funny because as a teacher you feel some responsibility to like you know impart a certain amount of wisdom and understanding about what the craft is and how to do it. Yeah. And I, I don't want to be all weirdly obtuse and be like, there's, there's no way to know. You just have to like discover it. But I mean, I think it is like partially true that whatever your best laid plans are for creating something, I mean, I'm sure if you experienced this on the directing side, like you have an, a sense of what you're looking for. And then once you're in it, other possibilities reveal themselves to you where you hit roadblocks you didn't think you were going to hit and then you have to find a way to to move through it or around it or over it and I think it's in the trying to solve the problem that you know the most sort of revelatory things happen hmm. yeah what um you know your your journey into playwriting I think is fascinating would you would you mind t talking a little bit about being an actor in Chicago and what made you start writing plays? Um, yeah, of course. Uh, well, I was an actor in Chicago. I went to undergrad, you know, school for acting. I moved to Chicago. Uh, Liz, my wife, who I believe is watching on this Instagram live, I can't tell, um, <laughs> was working a full-time job and I was acting and that was, you know, very uh, cool. And then essentially she got pregnant and we had our first kid and mm -hmm. we uh, had to sort of reassess how we were gonna like organize our lives. And it wasn't quite, it wasn't an immediate thing, but basically over the next few years, like, you know, having kids and then I was working a full-time job and and I started to get sort of, uh, I guess, I don't know, frustrated is the right word. I just got, I just started feeling like I was losing my my footing. Like I wasn't able to really pursue acting the way that I had envisioned that I would be able to. And basically I had to sort of ask myself like what my life was actually about, you know, like what do you really want to do with your life? And I think it was very clear once I asked myself the question that I'd always really wanted to write eventually. And I thought it was something I would eventually do, but eventually it became more immediate. Mm 
you know, because it felt like time was precious and it felt like uh, something had to happen. So, so I just like started writing a play and I wrote it. It took me uh, two years to write my first play. Mm -hmm. And so uh, once I had written it, I sort of felt like, oh, I, I, I wrote a play and I felt really good about it, even though the play itself, you know, it was my first. So it's not like it was kind of masterpiece, but um, just the process of working on it and getting through it, I sort of felt like, okay, like, right now, what do I do? So I had to write another play because I was applying to grad schools and some of them needed two plays. Actually, Wind in the Breeze is the second play that I wrote mm -hmm. to apply to grad schools with. And that The version that I wrote for the, uh, initially was actually a, a little different than what we ended up with. There's only four characters didn't even have as much of a plot as it does now, even though it's not a very plot heavy play. But anyway, it was it was enough to sort of get some interest in and so I ended up going to Indiana University, uh and I studied with Ken Weitzman, who was the head of the program at the time, and so sort of learning um with him was really great and it was like three years of support and resources and time you know to to mm -hmm. work so that's kind of how i got my start yeah i think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is that it, it takes a lot of time to make new plays happen you know and which is beautiful that arena is giving you time you know these workshops times and they're not you know that i think that that's it, it's key yeah it is. I mean, ideas. yeah, sometimes you wish it would be faster, but then when it's fast, you're like, oh, wait, that's too fast. So, you know, I mean, I think deadlines are important, but at the same time, um, so is just, you know, I think it's just about structure, you know, it's about having, I mean, like the biggest thing that was really helpful for me was when I was in Indiana, you know, they actually would produce like full productions of the plays of the grad students, like two of them, um, a th second year and third year was full production. So like I went in knowing, okay, in the spring semester, I'm gonna have a full production of a play mm -hmm. and I have to write one <laughs> that's kind of, you know, that's, that's, and so just having that, that level of support where it's like, it's not a question of, oh, will this thing ever be looked at or produced? Like, um, that is a whole different ball game, you know, if you're talking about being in a position where you know that someone's gonna like put the thing up. And I think that's a very rare situation for a lot of playwrights, unfortunately, you know, um, for a lot of different reasons. I'm sure that why that's, those structures aren't always there um, for everybody, but at the time that I was in grad school for that um, it was really great, you know, because I think like if, if you're writing more into the ether, there can be advantages to that as well, but I think it's harder to organize yourself, you know, when there's not an event of some kind to write towards. So I usually will try to like make a false deadline for myself and like commit to like, okay, I'm going to do a reading and if the date is in the calendar, then I have to have something, you know what I mean, to show up with. So, Do you, how is it, because you started writing for television, how, yeah. how, I'm sure that there's, that's nothing but deadlines. Yeah. Um, how is, how, how was that transition for you? It was really great. I mean, um, it took me a couple of years of interviewing for, things sporadically to land a, my first TV job. But once I was in a writer's room, I mean, it's great. Like, for one thing, if you're a staff writer, like a lower level writer, who's it's your first job, you don't have a lot of responsibilities. You know what I mean? It's like, certainly you're being counted on to hopefully write a script, which I was, I did write a script for my first job. Uh, but in terms of the overall like structuring of the season and all the stuff, I mean, you have a whole group of people that you're working with, you know, in the writer's room. So really it's just about listening and 
being aware of what's needed and figuring out, you know, like what's the best way you can contribute to this project in this group. Uh, it's the kind of thing that like, I think most sort of like knowledgeable and sensitive humans could do, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's not super complicated. Um, mm. But the, the, somehow the barrier to entry is really high, even though the job itself, and I, I shouldn't say like, oh, it's just easy, anybody can do it kind of, and I don't wanna be like, like that, because especially if you're the one in charge and you really are responsible for putting the show together, it is a ton of work. But I found like as a beginning writer, it's a, it's a very natural learning curve. You know, you just get to be in a room, you get to be around the thing get to hear other people talk about their process and everything is so collaborative by necessity in terms of the writing that you just, you can't help but learn from everybody, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, and also like it, you know, it, it actually pays like yeah. really well and <laughs> you get like health insurance and you know what I mean? Like it's, it, yeah. it's like a real game changer in that way. Yeah. Um, so like that. yeah, yeah, it's good. Now, when you were in LA, did your family come out with you? Yeah, uh, well, the first time, no. Um, I was there for, I want to say it was like a 10 week, job. I don't know, I had a, a relatively short time. The first time it was like a 10 week job. Then the second time- I think that's when I saw you last. Okay, yeah, was that, oh, was it four during the production? I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they, so they didn't come out that time, but then the second job I had, which was last summer, uh, they ended up coming out from like May through um, July, uh, because it's just a long time to be away from your babies, especially when the, the baby's baby is like, you know, she's six now, but anyway, it's just, wow. yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um. How are you? How are you staying creative now? I mean, you said you're teaching still. Are you still writing? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, it's sort of like. So, like Liz, my wife, she made like this um, thing, <laughs> this like organizational thing, which is potentially. This is what I would do, but I can move the little things around so I can work on different projects. Oh. Um, just because, like, it's a way to keep, you know, self-organization or what have you. I guess if you can read that, but basically, like, That's you know, sure. work on a different project, whatever, move it around. So, like, that's been sort of helping. Oh, never mind. Um, that, that's been helping. And every day is just like a little different. But um, in any case. Um, Are you homeschooling like, your girls? Yeah. Um, although they have like, um, thankfully the schools themselves have curriculum. So it's not, you know, like some of it's sort of done for us, but um yeah, it's like, it's weird because, you know, obviously like we're sort of stuck, but at the same time, the work itself hasn't really, um, it still is what it is, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so I definitely feel very different because because the world has kind of stopped in a certain way and that definitely puts you in a different place. And so I wouldn't say that I've been like extremely productive, um, but at the same time, like just in terms of you know like this is my livelihood so i have to like keep things moving you know i can't like just say well i'm not gonna write for a while you know what i mean like mm -hmm. there's got to be some like progress happening so um so yeah i don't know um uh it's just in, in certain ways like i was like oh it's gonna be i'm gonna have so much time but it's actually in some ways it's the same in terms of the amount of things to do and not enough time to do it and how do you organize yourself. Um, and it's just the human factor of like, what is this, what is it to go through this thing that we're all going through, you know what I mean? Which 
um, I don't think writers have a, un a unique thing there, really. It's just like everyone's going through that. So, um, yeah. Yeah. How do you think that things will shift once the doors come back open? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I guess the first question is like, what doors are going to come back open? You know what I mean? Like, right. Um, like knowing it's it's been sort of interesting. I mean, I shouldn't say that I wasn't aware of this, but I, I will say that um, on some level, like it's been a real um, eye opener to see just just how interconnected all of our various systems are. You know, like financial and community and, you know, supply chains and like how everything, like, you know, something that's this, because in a certain ways, as much as that, I mean, this is a huge thing affecting a lot of people. Um, it's like, it's not just a simple matter of, oh, this number of people is sick. It's like, how much capacity do we have to take care of? this many people at one time, what does that do? What are the domino effects of that? You know what I mean? So, mm. um, and obviously like the arts are really fragile, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess for the most part, I'm just thinking about, you know, people, you know, like friends and colleagues who have, who are struggling and like, you know, just being, out of work or potentially out of work or furloughed or um having your productions canceled you know i mean that happened to me you know also like having your production canceled but like yeah it's just it's it's sort of um like it's just kind of humbling to see just how how quickly it can all sort of stop you know um yeah. how quickly it can all disappear and also just realizing that as much as we you know, like, yes, of course, that the arts are, they mean everything to us. And like, we get, we give our whole lives to making art, but it's also like, it's not, it's not the same as, um, you know, making food, you know what I mean? It's not the same as, as delivering uh, essential um, resources for survival, you know what I mean? It's, it, yeah. So I think it's just a reminder of, you know, like, the people in our society who really actually hold it together just mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis you know and it's, and it's not us you know what i mean like mm -hmm. as much as we would love to believe that we are at the center of the universe mm -hmm. and that we are in a certain way or a certain you know in a certain from a certain viewpoint but like in this moment it's like no it's clearly not us that's keeping the world um, yeah, you know, like spinning. What do you think? What do you think? Um, I guess the function of art, but specifically theater. What's the function of theater in society? Do you think? I mean, like in general? Yeah, like because now, like what you're saying, it's exposing how fragile and sort of non-essential what we do is. What do you think? Um, why do you think it matters? I guess. I don't know. I mean, like, I, for myself, I fell in love with theater by just being in theaters. Mm -hmm. Like, when I, it was funny, because I was trying to trace, like, what is the moment? What's the thing? I don't really, I don't really think that there was, a, um, like, one performance, per se, that open my eyes to this is the, it was just there was a certain feeling about like even being backstage just the atmosphere the rarefied air of it the fact that everyone's there paying attention to one thing so there's something that is essential about that in terms of like our need to communally experience something especially when it's a story that's told on purpose that says something about who we are so um <clears throat> it might not be essential as in like a thing that will literally keep us breathing right um but in terms of our understanding of ourselves and our um our collective understanding of who we are i, I do think it's has a very important place 
And it's obviously not only the theater, it's also other form of payment and, and other forms of writing and stories, um, not all of which require there to be, you know, a live audience. But there's also something different about gathering together too, you know, so. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You know, um, Nathan, every time uh, I get to interact with you, there's there's something about you that radiates, I think, in your rehearsal rooms and when actors speak your words and when just interacting with you in person. It's just this calmness, this stability, this, um, you have an ability to, um, uh, cut through the bullshit. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. You know, you can just come at someone and go slow down. Let's just really talk about, you know, there's something, <laughs> the uniqueness about you that I've always really admired. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. I mean, um, I'd like to think that I have a good effect on people, but you know, I guess in a certain way, it's like, you don't know that until you are, you hear somebody say it or until you're like at least around people, you know? Mm. And that has been one of the sort of biggest challenges of this time is like, you know, the limit, the fact that we just can't be around each other yeah. is how much that, that hurts, you know, just not to be able to be in the same room as somebody. Yeah. Um, because there's so much, that, there's so much of communication that is that like energy, you know what I mean? Like, you can't really substitute for that. I mean, maybe you can kind of a little bit, but like, you know, um, I don't know. It's, it's, um, it's, it's weird. It's weird times. Yeah, I agree. Do you, do you, um, did you find an item for show and tell? Oh, I totally did. This is a book called Frog and In Toad, Toad. Storybook uh -huh. Treasury. I'm sure you all know about this, this book. I mean, it's actually like three or four books in this one book. But my parents read this to me when I was little. I read it to my kids. I think it's the best uh, children's book that I've personally come across. Mm. I think the reason is because um, there's something about the way that it presents life as it is, which is really uh, quite profound, I think, actually. Um, like most, most stories in general, and certainly children's stories, you know, they have like a particular message that they want to say in part. It's like, let's help kids learn this skill or let's and there's nothing wrong with that I'm not saying that's oh don't show kids lessons like I'm not saying that but there's something that's really beautiful and simple about that book because it's just like two flawed amphibians living their lives <laughs> together and like being friends and and just things happening you know mm -hmm. um and uh I think it allows you to sort of just access like this is one that's this one story that I didn't really appreciate before. It's called um, a swim. Basically, like if you're not familiar with the books, like Toad is the friend who's kind of like not as cool and is always like doing the wrong thing, and then mm -hmm. Frog is more the like I guess quote unquote normal one. Although they're both you know whatever. Um, but Toad is, is kind of silly. So this is one. This is one episode. This is one story where Toad is gonna like crawl. He wants to go swimming, but he just feels silly in his bathing suit, so he doesn't want to show his bathing suit. So he just like stays. Um, he hides behind a rock, and Frog is like, "Yo, come in and swim." And Frog's like, and "Toad's like, no, I look silly in my bathing suit." And then all the animals come around. And all of them ask why Toad is hiding. And Frog tells them us because he doesn't want to be seen in his bathing suit. So they all wait for him to, so because they, they want to see the bathing suit now. So they all just sit there and wait for Toad to like come out. And finally he comes out um, because he's getting cold and they all laugh at him. <laughs> mm -hmm. And 
even a frog laughs at him. And Toad's like, why are you laughing? He's like, because you do look silly in your bathing suit. And Toad's like, of course I do. He just walks away. And that's the end. Mm. <laughs> like, that's it. So just like, oh yeah, sometimes you get embarrassed and then you walk away and you're okay. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't want to make too much of a meal out of it, but I just, I, I feel like there's something about just simply showing, uh, putting yourself in the middle of the feeling as it is and just being in it. And then allowing you to come to your own conclusions about what it means for you, you know, um, mm -hmm. is cool, so. You know, um, there's a similar message. <laughs> there's a similar message in The Wind and the Breeze, you know. I think a lot of, I, 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 it was interesting. It, I definitely didn't anticipate hearing, um, you know, I think I told you on a single day I got two letters. <laughs> One was saying it was it was uh, one of their favorite things they had seen, and the other letter was saying, "I don't understand what this play is about." <laughs> blah blah blah. Why yes. did you do it? And it, it, but there is something about the play that is just you you present you, you present, and you know, you set it up. He's waiting for the fireworks, and at the end of the play, he does get those fireworks. They're not how what he anticipated them looking like, right? But they were still there and so you know you gave the audience the catharsis but people for some reason i think some people wanted something more but it's like your frog and to toad story it's no you're just presenting it as it is life itself which i think and and, and because of that we could all take something a little bit different from the experience it was a bit more ambiguous of an ending which i always enjoy that cool I'm glad that that, um, good. <laughs> I'm glad that works. Well, yeah, I guess there's a certain way in which like, since it's maybe good to get those letters too, or that's like, what is this? Yeah. Um, Cause you know, like it, like I would, I would love to be able to have everybody be happy with, you know, whatever I make, it's just not the reality. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely like, sometimes I'll see a play and I'll just be like infuriated, like, what is this? <laughs> like, why am I, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel that way too. Sometimes I see something, not always for the same reasons as somebody else. I mean, we all have our different like reasons for what we've, it's just funny too, like how, how something about sitting in the theater makes you like, you can get so mad, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, there's something about, like acknowledge like acknowledging the the like time it takes and the attention it takes to like just focus with these human beings and like and like see these actors go up there and like be you know present in the story that it just it just feels like it it's, it's a big deal it feels like a big deal even if it's a you know, a small theater and only a few thousand people will ever see the play. But there's something about it that like, when we see it, we're like, no, this, this matters. It has to matter. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. we really want it to matter. And so, like, I think it's just funny how, um, how some, sometimes we just, like, really want, we, we want it to reflect our, our own worldview, I guess is what it comes down to, right? It's like, um, or to like do something that somehow resonates with us. And if it doesn't, um, we're like, oh, <laughs> we feel cheated somehow, you know? Yeah, I just read this book backwards and forwards. It's just about like how, oh, to, yeah. how to read plays. I always, people would always said read it. And I finally was like, well, now I have some time. <laughs> um, and in, in it, <laughs> the, the, the writer talks about when you go to the theater, exactly what you're saying there's this level of focus you're competing with an audience who has to use the bathroom mm -hmm. so the play better be better and it better be worth it for them not to get out of their seat to go to the bathroom <laughs> because it because it is you know and you look at like someone like shakespeare who who was a master going okay every 45 minutes or whatever you know there has to be an event that gets us to go lean in to go okay what's next what's next what's next um but otherwise you know there there I'm sure we all have experiences times when we're at a play when we feel a little trapped <laughs> or you feel like, oh my gosh, I can't get out of the row or, you know, I, 
or there's more people on stage than there are in the audience. And I have to be really focused because they can see my face. Mm -hmm. And I have to make sure I'm smiling and, but um, yeah, it is a unique experience. Yeah. Which is the beauty of it, that it is, it is. live. And... The danger of it, of, oh, this could be really bad. This could be mm -hmm. really, you know, or this could all fall apart at any moment. Um, and somehow I think it's something about the fact like one thing that I've never, at least so far, I haven't ever, I guess, lost is still like, you know, that moment when you go and see a play and like when the lights go down, right? And it's about to start. Uh, like, I still feel like it's still the most exciting time, you know, in mm -hmm. the world. Like anything is possible, you know, right now. Like this play might blow my mind. This thing could be the best thing I'll ever, you know what I mean? Like, um, and like, yeah, usually it doesn't totally happen, but like sometimes it does or certain moments it does and it always could, you know what I mean? Um, so I think that's something that, and maybe that's just part of going back to the, I guess the, I guess the sort of attraction to it. It's like, it's not even really about, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just like wanting to be around that, you know, like wanting to somehow have a, life that i was just watching that documentary um the rest i make up about maria irene fornes oh and, yeah um, i've seen that yeah it's it's really wonderful i think it might be free right now or it might be available is it on um, amazon prime i watched it on canopy okay but i feel like it might be I, th I think it could be it might be available for free for a while you know mud is probably one of my top five favorite plays yeah She's an incredible writer. I said my students read that. Um, we just discussed it this week, actually. Um, really? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But something she, something she said was, and I'm sure you've heard this before, and I might be misquoting it, but basically it's, she said, like, theater is not a way to make a living, but it's a way to make a life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I think... Certainly at a time like now when you aren't able to go, I think you're really, re I'm reminded of, oh yeah, this is such a key part of my life, you know, it was like being in these places and, you know, um, being around mm. that thing. Yeah, she has, I, I read a quote when she passed last year, I was, I read a quote by her that she, that she said, uh, I wish that theater makers and theater producers would stop picking plays and producing plays that they feel like they should be doing, that they feel like mm. their audience will come to because it's a commercial success or whatever, and start picking plays from the heart and start <clears throat> and stop being driven by maybe what's trendy or the issue driven play and just pick plays that push the forum forward. And I, 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 I kind of, wow. I kind of try and use that as a due north now when I read a play. That's that's great. I mean, I, I messed up her quote. I mean, I could probably find it. It's it's she's <laughs> very, very yeah, um, well spoken. Um, so now we can like, if anyone has any questions for Nathan, feel free to ask them. One question that was sent to me was, um, what do, do, do are there any plans for winning the breeze? Will it be seen again? I don't know. <laughs> no idea. I have not heard any, any so um, I guess that is to be determined. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, since the Signet production, I, I have not uh, had any further productions of that play. And like, I sort of just been focused on other stuff, you know, because I think at a certain point, like that play, I really stopped working on it in like around 2016-ish, you know, like we did that commission with, with you guys, right? Mm -hmm. um, at Signet Theater, the finish line commission. And like, that's the last time I made real changes on it. And I remember thinking like, okay, well in this production, maybe I'll learn some things about it, whatever. And I know we were talking even about like, oh, you know, like possible changes. And like, I couldn't, 
I, I was like, I, I can't really do it. I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't quite do it. And I feel like there's certain flaws that I see in the play, but I'm also like, you know, I think, I think it just is what it is at this point. You know what I mean? Because um, there's a, a certain point at which you have to like let a thing be the thing that it is, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that there may maybe a point where if other plays that I write become successful, then maybe somebody would be like, oh, let's look at one of the breeze, you know what I mean? But mm. um, probably until then, it's probably not going to be, uh, I would I would doubt it's, it's going to be produced. We'll see. I mean, you never know how things go, but yeah. Well, how do you determine the next project you want to work on is a question. That's a really good question. Um, you know, okay, so I think um, right, right, I, I've never, I've, is this true? I've, I've, I've very rarely just chosen, oh, I'm going to do this thing just because I want to do it. It's always been some kind of deadline or some kind of like, except for like the first two plays, even the second play, which is one of the breeze. Like I wrote that because, oh, I had to apply to grad school. I didn't have time to think. So I was just like, ah, and I wrote it out. And, you know what I mean? So, so I think really it's about, it's about necessity. It's like, okay, you know, do I have, do I have a definite deadline? Um, do I have a commission that I have to fulfill? If I don't like, what am I writing in order to sort of like meet the next immediate need? Um, and there's definitely certain things that I might have, that I've been thinking about uh, percolating in my mind for a while that I, I know that at some point I want to make space for them. But I think I mostly just try to be in the moment. And um, oftentimes if I think about something clearly enough where I'm like, oh, I want to write a play about this and this will happen then I like mess it up and then it's not good and it's boring to me and then I stop. You know what I mean? So, um, so I, have to, I think I have to trick myself almost. Like I have this workshop coming up at arena stage and right. uh, I shouldn't be saying this probably <laughs> publicly, but like, I'm like procrastinating like crazy working on the play for the workshop and instead I like switched and did something else I'm not supposed to be doing. You know what I mean? Cause it somehow feels like, easier to be productive that way you know what i mean so mm. i don't know i guess mind games is the answer it's not really even a direct answer to the question do you you know something i've noticed recently with myself is that and maybe you're speaking a little bit to it is i'm a really good beginner like i can start a project really easily and i'm a really good finisher you know mm. if like when it comes to theater it's like you know tech previews i'm really good at the polishing it's that middle right. section that yeah. it, it gets scary for my for me because I I think it's because it's like the first the beginning you're responding to the first brushstroke on the canvas everything's in reaction to whatever that beginning was and then you're afraid you're like oh I'm gonna cut off all possibility for other choices by setting things now and I don't know if that's it or what but do you do you find that like when you're you know when you start a play you're on fire for it and then somewhere in the middle you're like i don't know how to what to do with this now or no yeah you, totally. is that what's happening with the arena commission uh sort of like i have a draft of that that um oh i have a thing i can put my phone on sorry i've been holding this phone and it's like making me crazy no nope, can't do it Darn it. Lies. Anyway. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I have a draft for that play. And like, but yeah, I guess you could say it's still finishing because I know there's things that need to be, you know, altered for the next draft. Um, so yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, um, I think now more than previous times I've been able to like actually um, like I edit as I go more. I used to just like be a little bit more f free of like, okay, just whatever, you know, I think now 
I tend to like do more stopping and starting in the beginning mm. um, for whatever reason. I'm not sure if that's even a good thing. Um, but yeah, like I, I think in general, I, I always tell this to people like who, like a, a lot of my students or whomever, like it just like, it's always harder to finish it than it is to start. Mm. Um, and certainly the middle is the way you get <laughs> the most lost, so. What is your, uh, the, this is another question, what is your best advice about deciding and applying to graduate programs? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, I would say one thing would be take your time would be the first thing because a lot of people will look at applying to graduate programs as like a year's, like multiple years pro process, you know? Um, you don't always get into this places you wanna get into right away. Um, so like be patient with yourself and, t and you're gonna give like two or three years to a place. You wanna make sure that you're sure about it. So take your time, uh, reach out to, you know, like, current students, former students, even faculty of programs that you're interested in and ask questions, um, genuine questions that you wanna know so that you can kind of have more of a sense of what places are like. Um, and I would say like, definitely think twice about going to a place that charges tuition, you know? Um, I mean, I think mo th there are grad programs that have free tuition or fellowships. Um, and, you know, theater is not a field that is high paying. And if you, if you don't have a lot of financial resources available to you, it can be tough, you know, to, um, to shell out a bunch of money for tuition, you know? Um, so I think things is a big decision. That's not to say you shouldn't ever do it. Like if you have the ability to it, like more power to you. But I also think it says something about priorities of an institution when, you know, they're paying you as opposed to the other way around, you know? Mm -hmm. um, because in, in theory, what they're saying is, look, we believe that your value as a graduate of this program and as a writer is going to be worth it to us to pay you for your time here, you know? Wow. And that's a better situation to be than a place where you're having to pay to sort of get attention, if that makes sense, you know? or. Um, mm -hmm. And again, that doesn't mean that all programs that charge tuition are bad or, or bad intentioned, but I think it's something to really consider. Mm, that's wise advice. Um, is there anything that you want to leave us with, Nathan? Um, <clears throat> anything to leave you with? I don't know. How are you doing, Robbie? Uh, I'm pretty <clears throat> good so far. I mean, you know, I've I've been pretty positive um yeah and, you know carved out a routine and i enjoy talking to friends like you and uh and it's sunny in san diego so i can always walk around a neighborhood in a mask and it you know see the sun i like your nose ring you do yeah you know i just needed some edge it was like last year i just like you know i just want some edge <laughs> yeah man it works Thanks. Um, I was I was trying to like find a, a cool thing to say, but I don't know if I I don't know, man. I'm not sure if I have anything that profound. <clears throat> Other than um, you know, like my mother doesn't like the nose ring. She she just commented. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, mom, for um encouraging something that was not okay. How are your parents? Are they in Rockford? They're in Rockford. They're good. Um, trying to make sure that they stay inside, <laughs> stay inside, and don't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, but they both, they both just retired. Um, this year, so thankfully they really can pretty much, you know, chill. We've been trying to Zoom them or Facetime them every week or so. Um. Well. Your your presence is is profound, I always say. 
I always think you're you radiate love and you your your heart is very big and um it's always nice to see you collaborate with you read your plays send me your plays I will send me more thanks Robbie it's real good to see you man you too give your family my love will do all right take care